Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Don't stop him, for no one who, has, who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. So whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better to you, for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. But every, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It's kind of a simple text to preach on as a guest preacher, don't you think? Grace to you and peace, sisters and brothers in Christ. Fellow stumbling blocks, I count myself as one, and also salt of the earth, salt for God's world. We are both. Amen. So what have you been praying about? Have you had something happen this week that was uh, provoked you to enter into earnest prayer? Uh, to, uh, um, to I have to confess, when I ran into this gospel lesson, I thought, I, I always choose the toughest lesson. So I thought, oh my goodness, now there, I, I need to do some praying about this. And it made me remember something in my life. Maybe some of the older folks have gone through this, younger folks, I hope you never do. In any case, I remember <clears throat> it's a weird thing when you read a gospel lesson and what comes to mind is a root canal experience you had back in life. Because I, I remember I, I went, one of the times that, that I found myself thinking about, I don't know why, that I found myself praying was I'd gone to the dentist because my teeth didn't quite feel normal. And of course, he comes in and he, he said, you've been having, you have an abscess under your tooth. It's been there for a long time. We have to do a root canal. And I remember thinking, please, God, get me through this because I'd heard a lot of stories. Uh, and I won't have you vote and tell me who's been through this joyful experience so far. In any case, I remember laying in the chair while the dentist was working on me, and thank God he could help my, me, and I still have that tooth. But when you take time to wrestle with today's gospel lesson, it kind of comes at you like a root canal. It's kind of surprising, a little bit shocking, and it's sobering because it's, it's telling us uncomfortable truth about ourselves. And it's also telling us great news about God who will not give up on us as well. So let's talk about that a little bit. So Mark often, uh, when you read the Gospels, if you've read through them, you know that when you get to the Gospel of Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark often portrays the disciples actually more like disciples because they just never get it. They just can't figure out what God's up to with Jesus can't get it right, and today's lesson is another example where the disciples don't get what Jesus is up to and misunderstand him completely. And if it doesn't, if you don't read scripture with the idea that Jesus could get irritated at people, I kind of think he might have had a tone of voice when he was talking to the disciples in the parts of our lesson that followed. So um, he said, they were upset that someone 
an exorcist, a magician, someone that wasn't one of the close followers of Jesus was using Jesus' name to throw out demons or to do things, and they're upset about this. And Jesus said, uh, you know, people can't use my name at all without it beginning to work on them, and so don't be so worried about this. Disciples. Uh, back in time, the early disciples, we often don't think of them like that. That's why I think Mark is kind of making a point. They didn't always get it. And it's good news for disciples today, because have all of you always gotten Jesus? Have you gotten everything right? I sure haven't. So, uh, and do you ever want to make complaints about someone else as you're living out your spiritual life? You recognize that happening? Uh, done any of that? Of course we all have, right? So, Jesus turns the tables on the disciples and back then and, and on us who like to focus on other people's spiritual problems or difficulties. Jesus turns the table and he warns the disciples in today's lessons to not be stumbling blocks to others in their spiritual lives. Yet, I think if we kind of take a stern accounting of ourselves, all of us can remember a time when we did something that actually we know got in the way of someone else's spiritual journey. The institutional church falls short of what God wants for us. Pastors blow it and fall short of what God wants for us. Leaders and congregational members, we're not perfect, we're disciples. So when Mark is talking to the disciples, I always just include myself in the bunch because I have my own moments where I have been confused, where I fail to trust God. And now in our time, one expert about church life says that one of the things we're doing in congregations in our anxiety about the fact that not as many people are coming to worship as they used to, we're having a harder time inviting people to be a part of the community of Jesus, that one of the things we do in our anxiety is actually go faster and faster and faster and try to do more and more things until we actually just wear ourselves out. This is Dr. Andy Root that I work with. He talks about this in a book called When Church Quits Working. And I think he's right that that's happening to us. And the other thing, has any, anybody ever grown angry or upset with someone else and then things come out of your mouth or you do things that you wish you could take back? I mean, we all have this experience with our families, our friends, our neighbors, and at church. My pastor of my childhood and my into my confirmation years used to get up and imagine I have a huge whiteboard here, a chalkboard. He'd write a pretty good size S. Then he'd write an A, an I that filled it from the, the top to the bottom, and then a little N. And then he'd say, yeah, sin, that's when I have center of the universe disease. That's when I think I'm the one that it's all about. So I've always held on to that because I think that's true and that's one of the ways that we can become a stumbling block to other people. Now when we hear a passage that talks about uh, stumbling blocks, I think it's easy for us to jump immediately to personal sins that someone has committed. And when I served as a bishop for 18 years in southwest Minnesota, I became very clear again and again with deep sadness and remorse about how pastors can break people's trust and get in the way and become stumbling blocks for people's spiritual lives. So if you're here today and you've got a painful experience with a pastor, pastors are human. They fall short of the glory of God. I hope you could forgive them. I'm thankful you're here. Or if you have a friend that that's happened to, you should invite them here. Sometimes we give the message that pastors are perfect and it is a stumbling block when we give that message, right? So you can kind of flip this around. So what has it been that someone has done in your life that's caused a stumbling block in your spiritual life? Do you have a memory? Do you have a painful moment? Most people do because the church is not a community of perfect people. It's a community it's a hospital for sinners. So, I mean, I could name a bunch of stuff. If I'm, if I'm being real self-centered, I know that 
that causes a stumbling block for my children, for instance. Or if somebody does business illegally, that can cause a stumbling block to the community. Uh, and uh, neglecting your family because you're doing good and important work. Paradoxically, that was one of my biggest struggles as a bishop, was trying to figure out how to navigate being a dad and a husband and serving in this different role. And if I became really judgmental, I could see how that would hurt people's spiritual lives. Well, we could create quite a list, and you probably would want to add things that have popped up in your mind, but I think the bottom line I wanted to name is today's text comes after us and warns us to not be a stumbling block in the lives of other people. The word in Greek hiding inside the text is skandalizo, which is where we get our word scandal from. And it literally means don't cause people to stumble. But in this context, when you translate it, it means don't damage the spiritual lives of people around us. Don't become a stumbling block. Woe to that person. So we're not so good that when we think about sin, to go back to my confirmation teacher, we often think of personal sins, but we don't, we're not so good at thinking about communal forms of sin, but there certainly are the, them. So one of the weird things that happened to me, I grew up in a church that was fiercely proud of being Norwegian. I heard rumors that might be, there might be some of that around here too. And uh, so we're very proud of our ethnic identity. And then I served in this role with 240 different churches, and I'm out visiting different churches day after day, and I started to notice how an overly large commitment to some ethnic identity can indirectly give the message to people that if you come from a different ethnic community or a different place, that you don't quite have the same status in the congregation that those who are the right people might have. And so I started to get uncomfortable about what I actually even called the ethnic idolatry of the Lutheran Church when I was talking about this sometimes. So that's all, I mean, it's all good what I got from my ethnic past, my ancestors, but when I make that too important, it can become a stumbling block to people who come from other places like Nathan, who's one of the students I'm working with, who's from Ghana, who's becoming a Lutheran pastor, he'll never feel like everybody in the church that he serves has his same ethnic identity. So I think that is one of the places, that's an example of communal sins that we get into trouble with. And I could talk about many other kinds of forms, but I think that if we do things without thinking about our neighbors who haven't connected to a church at all that might be from different communities of people and we're not intentional about making space for them, we can, we can actually become a stumbling block. And so um, this is also true about next generations. One of the things I really watched and that I was concerned about is that each generation has its favorite hymns, it has its favorite things in worship, it has its favorite things to do as a congregation. And if we're not open to the next generation, which has its dreams and its longing, we can communally become a stumbling block. And today's text warns us against that as well. And we can talk about historic problems. I'm, I'm overly interested because I lived in Redwood Falls with my Dakota neighbors all around me. There are things that have happened historically that are communal behaviors that have harmed people, and it's hard to figure out how you fix some of that history. So there's, there's personal forms of sin. There's communal forms of sin. We can cause stumbling blocks in a variety of ways. Today's text, Jesus is calling on us to be careful about being a stumbling block to others. So I, I want to come back to my assertion. I know it's hard news, it's bad news in a way, but we are all stumbling blocks personally and communally. And some of us cause others to stumble because we take ourselves too seriously. No, I won't have you raise your hand, but I might have mine up. Um, and then some of us are stumbling blocks because we don't take our lives and our capacity to make a difference seriously enough. And so that's another way we can become a stumbling block. 
So a congregation, a community of faith like yours exists to point to Jesus all the time, to keep Jesus at the center. When I came to visit you a few weeks ago, I came to worship. I saw the cross here hanging in the center and I thought, wow, what a powerful, what a powerful reminder of what is the center of this church's life. So um, God wants us to not be stumbling blocks, but rather God wants us to be uh, planting seeds of faith, hope, and love like I talked to in, to the children. Now, I know not all of you grew up in the Lutheran movement. Thank God you're here. We need you. And uh, if you didn't grow up in the Lutheran movement, you might not know about Luther's small catechism. So Luther was a reformer back in the 1400, or 1500s, and he wrote a little book to explain to parents how to teach the faith to their kids. It's called the small catechism. And when he talks about the Ten Commandments, he notes what the commandments say, thou shalt not do. But what I love is he goes on to say what God longs for us to do or what God commands us to do. So there's a no and there's a yes in each of the commandments that happens. So in the same way as this text comes at us with a no, don't be causing people to, do, to be stumbling, to be a scandal in their spiritual lives. Then on the other side, at the very end, in language that's hard to get hold of, it's hard to translate it, it's hard to understand it, I think God, what, what Jesus is teaching is that God can turn our lives into salt that seasons the lives of all the people around us. That God is constantly seasoning our life, preserving us, intensifying our flavor. Isn't that what salt does? For the good that God is at work in our lives and God longs for us to bring deepened taste and joy into the people's lives that God has placed around us. So the good news for today, if there's kind of some uncomfortable hard truths, then there's also powerful good news, and that is that God chooses to love you and me, and God salts us and causes us to be seasoned and spicy. I know that word sometimes gets used in other ways these days, but I think God actually wants congregations and Christians to be spicy, and uh, God does that. Uh, God works through relationships. For example, one of the ways you can salt your friends and your fellow congregants and, and complete strangers' lives is by simply giving them the gift of listening and trusting that God will find ways to set you free to be the salt of the earth that they need to season their lives to make them better. So in the same way that we can be stumbling blocks, God has the capacity to use our lives as salt and as seasoning to transform the lives of people around us. God's grace, um, when someone knows they have blown it, when you've really had a bad day, when you've made a profound mistake, there's nothing like the spice of God's grace to remind you that God won't give up on you and God's going to continue to work in your lives and transform you. In a world where people are dismissed for not being something, young people, old people, single people, God loves and treasures all of us, and God is at work empowering us and spicing, giving the spice of blessing to people who are normally not noticed. God treasures each and every one of us. So through God's power, even though we're capable of being stumbling blocks, God uses our lives as individuals and as community to actually transform and spice things up and make people's lives better that are around us. We come to worship on Sunday morning usually tired, sometimes wounded by the way life has been going, hoping for healing and renewal. We come here acknowledging that we're disciples that don't always get what it means to follow Jesus accurately. And we gather around the font that reminds us that we have been claimed forever as God's child. We'll soon gather around the table where we're reminded of God's forgiving grace and of God's promises of the kingdom. 
We start out, start out our week here around the altar, confessing and remembering that we're anointed by grace, praying with and for each other, and trusting that God will feed us through this meal and through one another. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in my sermon today on the hyperbole, but I just want to say it's hyperbole, kids. That stuff about cutting off hands and stuff like that, Jesus is making a point. He does not want you to do those things, okay? Just to be clear. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I think what Jesus is trying to say is what I'm talking about is urgent, so pay attention. You ever have your parents say that to you? I think that's what he was trying to do. So... Um, he wants to say it's important that we don't harm others, that we don't lead others astray. And all disciples can really count on is that Jesus calls us back to our baptism. Jesus forgives us. Jesus keeps blessing us with new life, a new identity, a new destiny. It's our only hope that God will salt us and work on us so we might become who God made us to be and who we might be. Now I'm gonna tell you a quick story from my life. It's a, it's a thing that happened about 10 years ago. So my son Sean was here in Minneapolis. We lived in New Ulm at the time. He came to Minneapolis and uh, in the evening he was walking across Washington Avenue right at university and and an SUV turned right on top of him and drove, him o drove over him. And um, so my son survived this accident. I don't quite understand it, but it was horrifying, right? To have your, this happen to your child. And then seven weeks later, he's supposed to go to McGill University in Montreal, Canada to begin his graduate studies. And so thank God he survived. He, he's fine. He rides his bike 30 or 40 miles this morning for exercise, you know, so he's doing fine. But when I took him up to uh, the university, to Montreal, I wasn't let, ready to let go of my son. I was grumpy and I was frightened and I was scared about his future and I'd lost my trust in people. And Sean said, hey, you know, why don't we go to, in, there's this Asian part of town just north of downtown Montreal. Why don't we go there and find some good food? So we went there. We found a Vietnamese restaurant. We sat down. I picked out a Vietnamese pho. And uh, the guy said, well, how do you want it made? And I said, well, I like it spicy. And he goes, really spicy? I said, yeah, I like it spicy and hot. And, uh, and uh, so he said, okay. So then he, he they went and made the food, and he brought it out, and I started eating it, and I noticed he was standing by the door of the kitchen kind of watching, you know. And all of a sudden, I, my, my family told me I had four rivulets of sweat break out and start running down my head, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't hardly breathe. And I'm thinking, whoa, this is really hot, you know. And then um, we started laughing, and all of a sudden, my... Feelings of fear and anxiety were broken by this incredibly hot spice. The cooks came out to laugh with us. <laughs> we're there laughing with strangers, having a great time, and suddenly it, it, the whole experience changed, and I was, felt comfortable that I could leave my son there, and it all went well, and it was just nervous dad problems, right? But I think about that. I think about that. My family never, always tells the story when we're together. Oh, remember when dad did this? Yeah. But I love that notion that God's spicy grace can come into our lives and shatter our fear and our anxiety and set us free to let people become who God is intending to them to become. So that's what God wants us to do, to save you and me to make our lives whole and full of joy. So receive the salt of God's grace, the spice of God's good news. You are all children of God. You are all precious children of God. And Christ has called you by name to follow him. And you are Christ's spitting image, the spitting image of his spirit and of his love. 
So the text ends with this phrase, have salt in yourselves and be at peace. The wholeness, the shalom of God with one another. So be at peace, receive the salt of God as you love God, as you love people, and as you follow Jesus your Lord. Amen.